is, um, you'll find out who he is over the course of the evening. But uh, this is uh, dedicated to a man called Terry Greenwood. Um, so my name is Jamie Kelsey Fry. I'm contributing editor for a magazine called New Internationalist. We uh, did a special on fracking uh, last year, around about September. And I thought I knew a fair bit about it, um, but there's, it's a huge, wide, complex issue. And uh, it's obviously the reason that so many people are here tonight. So we're really grateful that you're here. Um, a couple of simple things. The obvious one, turn off your mobile phones would be good. Okay, most of Manchester have already done that, that's great. And uh, Nottingham, half the people turn off their mobile phones at that moment. Um, and in, uh, anyway, forget about the mobile phones. The other thing is this. Um, this was going to be a debate. Uh, and some of you may know, some of you may not know, so it's worth explaining how the situation has changed. And we'd like your help in this as well. Uh, we had invited uh, all the leading in industrial groups, Quadrilla, Dart, iGas, etc. We've invited them plenty of times. Uh, we've invited all the key uh, government figures who are promoting fracking as a, as a good energy solution for the country. Um, and we did our best to get them to field the strongest pro-fracking side to talk to a strong anti-fracking side. And they've, most of them have stonewalled us and not got back at all, although we've contacted them a great deal. Um, and the rest have decided not to come. But we are fighting to keep London a debate, which is on Monday in Westminster. Any help you could do to push those industrial... Because I'm telling you now, if Channel 4 News rang them right now and said be on TV tonight, they're there, aren't they? Yeah. Exactly. So help us get them to come for a fair, independent debate. That's all we wanted. So instead, we have the anti-fracking panel. We've expanded it a little bit with a couple of extra people. Hey. Uh, well, <laughs> I was going to ask... Um, I was going to ask how many people in the audience are anti-fracking, but that, that's, that, that's uh, pretty in indicative. But what's more important is this, if you're brave enough, put your hands up if you are undecided. We know 11 people signed up who are undecided. One, two, three, four, five. Brilliant. Okay. You guys are incredibly important to us. Uh, you're going to have people talking from the panel, um, and then there's a good section for Q&A afterwards. And we know we've got some strong people who are pro the industry, and they are incredibly important as well. Um, so please use the Q&A bit. However, um, the first part really, uh, before we go to the panel, a lot of people want to know who the hell are you guys and who's behind it all, who's paying for it, what's going on? So transparency is also really, really important. So I'm going to pass over to our friend and partner, uh, Joseph Corey. I just was in the toilet trying to clean a load of wine off my trout. Um, <laughs> hello, thanks for coming. My name's Joseph Corre. I'm Vivian's son. Um, I started off in business, uh, God, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago. I started helping my mother initially uh, for about 10 years, helping to build her business. I then left that at a point when I felt she was secure and started my own business, started from one shop, a company called Agent Provocateur, um, which I ran and turned into an international brand over about 12 years. I then sold that company six or seven years ago. I had nothing to do with it anymore, don't understand it. Sort of find it a little bit kind of cringy every time I look at it these days. Um, anyway, <coughs> um, when I left that, I set up and helped form a makeup company, which is what I do now, a company called Illamasca, and a, another clothing brand in London. But I also set up a charitable foundation called Human Aid, um, which really uh, deals with human rights violations and sustainability <coughs> projects. Um, and Human Aid is the charity that's paying for this tour that we're putting on and this whole campaign. Um, as you probably know, uh, I'm talking to people uh, like sort of some of these sort of quango-ish, I don't know, environmental agencies that are backed by sort of strange charities that kind of, you don't really know who's funding them. 
Uh, we're the opposite of that, and I can tell you quite clearly that uh, for transparency's sake, for this particular project, um, it's being funded by myself, by Vivian, and by the cosmetics company called Lush. <clears throat> Um, about eight or nine months ago, I, uh, I didn't really know anything about fracking. You know, I'd seen one or two little mentions of it, um, and I bumped into Jamie, uh, actually at the funeral of Bruce Reynolds, who was the mastermind of the great train robbery. When I was a child, I was fascinated by that. They were my heroes, particularly Ronnie Biggs. Anyway, another story, but he talked to me about... Um, this uh, situation in Balkan, and would I come down and take a look at it? So I went down there, Vivian came as well, and uh, after that I really started to do my own research into what fracking was, and I have to say, when I looked into it, I was extremely shocked. And the further that I looked into it, I decided something had to be done, and we needed to talk about it. What I find one of the most shocking things is that half the country don't even know what it is, and the other half seemed to be completely confused by a sort of misinformation, I have to say from both sides, um, where we don't seem to be able to get the media and the government and the industry to kind of tell us the clear truth. So either one of two things is happening here. Either, gov either the government has done the worst job in history in trying to explain and communicate something that's actually all for our benefit, or they've got something to hide that they're not really showing. So, anyway, without further ado, we've brought some great people here, and uh, yeah, that's it. Um, you know, help yourself and uh, see you later. <laughs> this for the um, eight people who are undecided, uh, in the sense that, um, oh no, let's do the uh, film first. Yeah, so. Have we got A.V. Uh, Richard from the Ninja team? Is that all ready somewhere? Yeah. Yeah? Cool. Okay, great. So what we've been doing, we've had a brilliant time doing this. Uh, it's pretty hard work because we've been doing, we did Glasgow on Monday, Nottingham last night, and here in Manchester tomorrow we're in Swansea. Um, and we've got a really good team of, uh, we call them the Ninja Filmmaking Crew. And what, what's been good for them to do is to go out into the streets in each city, speak to people and see what they know about fracking, what their opinions are about it. Okay, so we're just going to watch a clip of uh, Mancunians in action in the street. I've heard of it, but I'm not 100% sure what fracking actually is. I have no idea what fracking is. I've just heard this word for the first time. I thought it was a, maybe an, an English slang term that I didn't know. <laughs> I know a little bit about fracking. Not a great deal. But apparently it's not very good for the environment from what I've heard. But I've seen in America, the surge, you know, the water faucets. Um, like, as they've been pouring water, gas has been coming out, and I've seen one guy actually set fire to it, and like, it's been like a flamethrower coming through his kitchen, so... I don't know whether I'm for fracking or not for fracking, because, to be honest, I don't know too much about it. The all, all, only thing I know is what I've heard of the media, and what I've heard of the media is that fracking, we need fracking because it's going to contribute towards our energy supplies which are dwindling. If fracking was coming to, coming to an area near me, yeah, I'd definitely want to know more about what it is, the processes. I don't think uh, people in the United Kingdom know that much about fracking because it's not really like widely publicised, it's pretty much like kept out of the media. Well, I'm guessing there's not very many people that I know which, especially the people I associate with, don't know much about fracking whatsoever. I think people should know about it and I think it should be a... It, the media should show more of it, but the media don't like to do that, do they? We, sh we should have the right to say, yes, this can happen, and no, fracking can't happen. Um, everybody should have their own say and their own vote. OK, um, Iron Mate, great band. Uh, OK, so for the uh, eight undecideds, um, we thought it would be brilliant to find a short film that was just totally unbiased and totally clear describing the actual technology uh, of the industry itself, okay? So, this is a Dutch film, it's got an English uh, commentary over it, but it's, we found it to be the most unbiased one there is. So, here you go. What is hydraulic fracturing or fracking? Since the Industrial Revolution, our energy consumption has risen unceasingly. 
The majority of this energy consumption is supplied by fossil fuels like coal or natural gas. Recently, there's been a lot of talk about a controversial method of extracting natural gas, hydraulic fracturing or fracking. Put simply, fracking describes the recovery of natural gas from deep layers inside the earth. In this method, porous rock is fractured by the use of water, sand and chemicals in order to release the enclosed natural gas. The technique of fracking has been known since the 1940s. Nonetheless, only in the last 10 years has there been quite a fracking boom, especially in the USA. This is because most conventional natural gas sources in America and on the European continent have been exhausted. Thus, prices for natural gas and other fuels are rising steadily. Significantly more complicated and expensive methods, like fracking, have now become attractive and profitable. In the meantime, fracking has already been used more than a million times in the USA alone. Over 60% of all new oil and gas wells are drilled by using fracking. Now, let's take a look at how fracking actually works. First, a shaft is drilled several hundred meters into the earth. From there, a horizontal hole is drilled into the gas-bearing layer of rock. Next, the fracking fluid is pumped into the ground using high-performance pumps. On average, the fluid consists of 8 million liters of water, which amounts to about the daily consumption of 65,000 people, plus several thousand tons of sand and about 200,000 liters of chemicals. The mixture penetrates into the rock layer and produces innumerable tiny cracks. The sand prevents the cracks from closing again. The chemicals perform various tasks. Among other things, they compress the water, kill off bacteria, or dissolve minerals. Next, the majority of the fracking fluid is pumped out again. And now the natural gas can be recovered. As soon as the gas source is exhausted, the drill hole is sealed. As a rule, the fracking fluid is pumped back into deep underground layers and sealed in there. However, fracking is also associated with several considerable risks. The primary risk consists in the contamination of drinking water sources. Fracking not only consumes large quantities of fresh water, but in addition the water is subsequently contaminated and is highly toxic. The contamination is so severe that the water cannot even be cleaned in a treatment plant. Even though the danger is known and, theoretically, could be managed, in the USA already, sources have been contaminated due to negligence. No one yet knows how the enclosed water will behave in the future, since there have not yet been any long-term studies on the subject. The chemicals used in fracking vary from the hazardous to the extremely toxic and carcinogenic, such as benzol or formic acid. The companies using fracking say nothing about the precise composition of the chemical mixture. But it is known that there are about 700 different chemical agents which can be used in the process. Another risk is the release of greenhouse gases. The natural gas recovered by fracking consists largely of methane, a greenhouse gas which is 25 times more potent than carbon dioxide. Natural gas is less harmful than coal when burned. But nonetheless, the negative effects of fracking on the climate balance are overall greater. Firstly, the fracking process requires a very large consumption of energy. Secondly, the drill holes are quickly exhausted and it's necessary to drill fracking holes much more frequently than for classical natural gas wells. In addition, about 3% of the recovered gas is lost in the extraction and escapes into the atmosphere. So how is fracking and its expected benefits to be assessed when the advantages are balanced against the disadvantages? When properly employed, this technique offers one way in the short to medium term to meet our demand for lower cost energy. But the long term consequences of fracking are unforeseeable and the risk to our drinking water thus should not be underestimated. Okay, so it's pretty complex science. Some people have described it actually as a sort of form of genius in terms of industrial innovation. Um, but there's your background. So this is what we're going to be discussing tonight. Uh, so I'm going to pass over to the first, um, first person on the panel. People are going to get 
let's face it, it is four, okay? We're going to pretend it was three and then get an extra minute if it's four. So what I'm going to do with this really sophisticated uh, musical instrument here, that's going to be when you've got a minute left. Is that all right? So sorry about the pressure. Um, what else can I do? Hello. So uh, we're going to start with uh, Rachel Thompson. is a local campaigner, so she's worked with North and Gas Gala, and we all know and love her very well. Um, so Rachel's going to be giving you the sort of more local campaigning perspective. Okay? Over to you, Rachel. Hi, um, you're going to have to excuse me, I'm not really good at public speaking. Um, so I'm Rachel, I grew up just a few miles down the road from Barton Moss. My family still live there, my two nieces still live there. Barton Moss is one of the sites in Manchester, we've got another one in Daverhume. And in September last year we heard in a national, oh, we heard in a national newspaper that iGas were about to come and start exploratory drilling. Over the summer we've been watching in Balkan what had happened and this was a shock. We had no idea that iGas were going to come and do this in our community. Nobody's informed us, nobody's consulted us and nobody asked us if this is what we wanted. So went away, I did my own research and iGas held a public open day here. Um, went along, they hadn't told anybody, we found out by accident they'd leafleted, they said, within a mile. I've still yet to find anybody who knew this was happening. So with my research, I asked iGas, how many wells will it need? Because I've read that the wells finish really early and you have to have more. I've heard that there'll be 100,000 in the northwest alone. They refused to answer. They kept saying, we don't know until we've drilled, we won't know this. And throughout this campaign, this is all we've had from this, from this industry. We've had smoke and mirrors tactics. We've had them greenwashing. They won't give us a real advice. We've had to go to the internet. We've had to speak to each other. And we've gone to our local MPs. We've gone to our council. We've got 3,000 people to sign a petition to get the council to actually discuss this with us because they'd already granted a license to iGas. When people turned up to that meeting, the council refused to discuss it, even though the 3,000 signature means they're meant to. Um, and what we realised from the very beginning was we're on our own. Like, nobody's going to come and help us. If we don't do this, if we don't go and learn all the facts from this industry, because they keep throwing science at us, we've got to try and learn the science. Our MP isn't going to help us. Our local council isn't going to help us. We've got to stand up and do this for ourselves. We've just got, where is the democracy? We've had the government throwing at us time and time again, this is good for you. And when we say we don't think it is because we've done research, they don't answer. They answer with it's stuff from the industry. They don't listen to their own advisors. We know that AMEC have said it's not going to bring that many jobs. The government paid them for that advice. The government have never, ever <coughs> quoted the AMEC report. We felt ignored, we felt betrayed. And we felt like we've been treated like we're idiots. We just keep being told, this is good for you, you should accept it. And when we can blatantly see, we've seen what's going on in America, we can blatantly see that that isn't good. So we got together and we said, right, me and a few friends said, right, we've just got to do something. So after work, we'd go knocking on people's doors in the area close to Barton Moss. And we said, do you want to have a meeting? Let's discuss what's going to happen. And the local people were like, yeah, we've not been told anything about this. They live less than a mile from this site. And at that, we decided, actually, the government haven't done a consultation. So what we'll do is we'll go and do our own consultation. So with a group of local people from, from the area, again, we went back after work, all of us knocking on doors, asking people to come and um, what they thought of fracking. We gave them DVDs. Um, and we went back a week later and we asked them, we found that 80% of people in the local area of Barton Moss do not want the fracking industry near them. At Barton Moss, people have come, they've come, people who've never been on a protest are there on the front line, they just want to walk slowly in front of trucks and show that they don't agree with this industry. And what they've been met with is a violent and brutal police force, a political police force who have put out press releases that have slammed us, that have told lies about us, and it's just been atrocious, but good has come out of this, because what we found is now, we know we're on our own, but we've united our community. We're gonna keep fighting this. We're watching what's going on in Australia, in America. We're going down to Balkan. Last weekend I was in South Wales, because they're just about to get it. And this is it, like, this is the time when people, we think people are gonna, in this country, are gonna stand up and fight this industry. Thank you, Rachel.
That's someone who's, someone who's not used to talking in public. Now, uh, our next person, also uh, we know really well, and she's been doing a magnificent job, as well as Rachel, doing a magnificent job uh, against fracking. Her name's Helen Rimmer, and she works for Friends of the Earth. So, Helen, when you're ready, okay. Thank you. So, yeah, I've been involved in the campaigns in Lancashire and also in, in Barton Moss, so I know the amazing work that Rachel and Tina have been doing, and it's a real privilege to be sat between the both of you this evening. Um, and it's great to see so many people here wanting to talk about fracking. So originally we were asked when this was conceived as a debate to give a response to the statement and the statement was fracking is an acceptable and effective way of securing energy for the benefits of Britain and I think it says everything that the industry have not come here to deny to defend that statement. I think that's all we need to know. If they were here they will probably be telling us that we need this gas because without this gas the lights will go out, we'll struggle to be heating our homes, that communities can relax in the knowledge that we have the gold standard regulation that the rest of the, the world is looking at. They tell us that it's low carbon so it can actually help us tackle climate change and of course they tell us here in the desolate north we should be flipping grateful for the jobs. <laughs> well, the industry and the government are very good at hyping it up but not much of their hype stands up to the scrutiny. We know that the best course for energy security and for a safe climate is not to deepen our dependence on fossil fuels, it's to invest in the renewable energy that we are drowning in in this country and to stop heat leaking from our homes and energy waste. Even, <laughs> even if the industry concedes that there will be no significant production of shale gas until the mid-2020s at the earliest. So this is no short-term fix. The industry are telling us it's not going to help in the short term. And as for the claim that we have gold standard regulation, well, we've just published a report based on our experiences in Lancashire, in Salford, and in West Sussex. And this is three years of looking at this industry when there's only been a handful of, of wells that they've had to deal with, not the thousands, hundreds of thousands that are on the cards here. And we found that the regulation is inadequate, it's flawed, and it's not being properly enforced or applied. And that's across the board. For example, in Barton Moss, I guess we're given um, permission to drill a coal bed methane well, a shallow coal bed methane well, but they just carried on going to 3,000 metres to test for shale gas because they know that's where the money is. In West Lancashire, um, near the village of Hesketh Bank, um, Quadrilla had um, permission for drilling there, but they had a time limit on how far they could drill because it's an internationally important site for wildlife. It's a Ramsar site of the highest protection. But they just ignored that time limit and they carried on drilling into the period where winter and birds were coming over to use that land. And no enforcement was that action was taken on either of those cases. And we know that the inadequate regulation, regulation can never make us safe, um, but the in inadequate regulation makes it much less safe for us. And this is big risks for the local environment, for the health of residents living near to drilling sites, and of course for our climate. So on climate change, they tell us this is going to be part of the solution, part of the transition. Well, John Ashton, who is one of the leading um, diplomats and, and experts in climate change and energy security, in his words, he said, you can be in favour of fixing the climate or you can be in favour of exploiting shale gas, but you cannot be in favour of both. And if you look at the evidence, that is completely true. And that's because shale gas is not low carbon, it's a fossil fuel. And there's a lot of research to suggest that this can be as bad or even worse than coal. That's because of the leaking methane, which is a hugely potent greenhouse gas, 32 times at least as powerful as, as carbon dioxide. So we know we need solutions, we need new solutions to our energy problems. We've got horrific fuel poverty here in the northwest. One in five people living in fuel poverty because of soaring bills, the power of the big six, and because of our heat leaking homes. But shale gas is not the solution to those problems. And I've got a much more positive vision for us here in the North West, and that's based on community-owned energy, on clean renewable energy, harnessing our vast resources of tidal, of sun, of wind, of geothermal. And that will create more jobs. It would create genuinely um, local benefits to the economy, and it wouldn't risk our precious environment. And we could be at the heart here in the northwest of a new industrial revolution. The industry are telling us we need to accept this as our industrial revolution, but we can have a clean industrial revolution, not one that will pollute, um, pollute our earth here for generations to come, but one that is based on clean energy and that will genuinely support communities. And 
To go back to the question, fracking, is it acceptable, is it effective? It's not acceptable, it's not effective. And more than that, it's not even necessary. We've got way better options. We need to be saying no to the dirty F word. Fantastic. I think that's fantastic. It's a terrible situation to make people rush because these are brilliant what people are saying, but there's going to be plenty of time during the Q&A to hear more. Okay, uh, one of the people who's been travelling with us on this tour only landed, whatever, five days ago or something. She uh, arrived at my, my, my flat where I live. Um, I've managed to get in touch with Liz Arnold um, through mutual friends in the States. And um, she's been really causing quite a stir in the audiences that we've been with so far and in the uh, interviews that we've been doing. We're really lucky to have someone who uh, comes from a country, Pennsylvania, where fracking's been going on for nine years. It's been amazing for us to see the difference between what we're being told consistently and, and what we're finding out from the reality of what it's like to live in a very seriously fracked state. Um, so, also, you're going to find out why we're dedicated tonight to Terry Greenwood. So, over to Elizabeth Arnold. Hey, y'all. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, my name's Elizabeth Arnold. I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And fortunately, Philadelphia itself is not currently being fracked because we have a, uh, there's no shale under Philadelphia and in our watershed, but there is a ton of shale upstream. But we've, um, we've had a ton of people speaking out and we've actually won a moratorium just for our watershed, which is also where New York and parts of New Jersey get their drinking water. So more than 15 million people get their drinking water from that watershed. So we've been able to stop it thus far, but it's not a permanent ban. So we're still fighting for that. So as Jamie said, we've been fracking for about a decade in Pennsylvania and we're up to about 9,000 fracked wells in Pennsylvania, which sounds like a lot, because it is, but the industry still wants to frack another 90,000 wells in our state, so we still think there's a lot to fight for. Um, we had a moratorium on our state forests and parks, but the governor actually just announced that he'd start drilling, he'd open up drilling in state parks and forest land just last week before I got on the plane. Um, so now we're fighting that too. Um, but I just want to talk a little bit about uh, really what, what these two just what Rachel and, and Helen just addressed because it really is, we've seen a lot of empty promises in Pennsylvania. We were promised 300,000 jobs. We've seen about 20,000 in the gas sector. About 60% of those um, are not Pennsylvanian held jobs. Those are folks coming in from Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, temporarily. Uh, these are temporary jobs, well-paid but non-union, very risky, um, and they're temporary. Um, fracking related worker worker deaths um, in the gas industry are actually up 25% this year um, due to fracking or this past year due to fracking so it's a, it's a very um, unsafe profession it's not one that I would be really really, really eager to get into um, but I really want to talk about the health impacts because uh, a lot of people just either don't hear about it or can't quite believe what's going on, but I can tell you because I've seen it and because these are my friends, um, that a, we've had a lot of cases of water contamination in Pennsylvania. And this shouldn't surprise anybody because according to the industry's own data, 5% of gas wells fail immediately, immediately. So that, that concrete barrier that's supposed to protect that super highway that's being drilled through all the layers of the Earth's crust to get to the shale layer, if that cement is not intact, if that breaks down, then you now have an open pathway for all the stuff that's going down and coming up to leach into other layers of the Earth's crust and thus also into the aquifer, or the underground water source. Um, so within 50 years, no, sorry, within 30 years, 50% of the wells will fail. So Pennsylvania is 10 years in, and if you look at, if you look at what's happened, it's the, the stati industry's own statistics are, are showing in Pennsylvania. So some of the health impacts that we're seeing, first people's water goes bad. Um, there's a ton of air pollution from the flaring of the gas. So people are waking up, um, 
often children with nosebleeds, neurological disorder damage, so people are kind of disoriented, things aren't working quite right. Um, a lot of skin rashes from bathing in the water. There, the official recommendation actually now is that you shower with your window open so that the gases and fumes can't build up because we've actually had people passing out in their homes. And as you know, if you pass out in the shower, it's extra dangerous. Um, you can knock your head really hard. Um, we've, ha we've seen, basically, you're, you're ingesting contaminated water. So anything in inside your body that that passes through the digestive system, you we're seeing a lot of swollen organs. Um, and now we're seeing uh, a lot of uh, cancer in, in pockets, in rural pockets that never had high rates of rare types of cancer before. Um, we've seen a lot of dead animals. The, the animals, the livestock, you know, people are keeping track of their own livestock that they're losing, but nobody's keeping track of all the wild animals that are dying, but you talk to landowners and they'll just, you know, they'll be walking around their property just finding dead possum after dead raccoon, after dead groundhog, after dead, you know, all the, all the local wildlife that we have. Um, and I wanted to show just, there's a lot more I could say, but I just wanted to show a short video clip as well. If you let me steal two more minutes, um, I'll show you a short clip. Because this is, this is, might be hard to hear. My name is Terry Greenwood. I live in western Pennsylvania, southwestern Pennsylvania, Washington County. I have a 60 acre farm we bought it in 1988. Uh, the gas company, we didn't, we had a lease that come with the property. But the 60 acres did not have no gas wells on. We had two springs, a well, and a pond for the cattle. The spring and the pond was for the cattle. So in 2007, the gas company come and said, we're drilling two wells on your property. And I said, go on the old rest of the farm and drill someplace else. Well, they said, we're going to drill two. So 2008, they come on our property. And this was an old lease from 1921. They come on our property. Drilled two vertical wells, 450 feet from our drinking water, and the the well on the top field is a thousand feet from the house. But it's it ruined all our property in that. Uh, within 30 days of the first well being drilled, our water our water come out of the spigot just like Dimmix water, like iced tea is what it looked like. That's what it come out of the spigot. So they started bringing us drinking water, and then February. When I lost all the cattle, they had a blowout, and all the water from the frack stuff was running into the pasture, into the pond where the cattle drank. And I had 19 head of cattle, and in 2008, so two and a half months later, my cows were having calves. I lost 10 calves out of 19 cows that were still born in a two-year-old cow. And I called the DEP, called the gas company, and the DEP did not do nothing. They said, that's a farmer's lock. And refused to do anything about it. Nobody has done nothing about it since. And I've had nothing but trouble with my cattle. But this old lease, it don't matter if it's a new lease, an old lease, once they're on your property, they're gonna do what they want to do. So we have a water buffalo, a 2,000 gallon water buffalo, which holds 2,000 gallons of water. And every four days, the, the gas company has somebody coming in, bringing 2,000 gallons of temporary water for our cattle. And that's all we have on our property now. Uh, uh, water dispenser, which we pay $800, rated $800 a year since 2009 for drinking water. So everybody thinks you're going to get rich. You're not going to get rich off it because it costs you more in the end. Yeah. They're the only ones that's making the money. So you don't want them to come into New York because they're going to do the same thing. If they can ruin 60 acres they're, and with a pond and springs, they're going to ruin big bodies of water up here. So you're better off to keep them out of this state. And water is more important than gas. You don't need the gas, but you need the water. And that's the most, most important. Once you ruin the water, you don't have nothing left. Okay, thank you. I, I, I know Terry. <laughs> Terry, does this mic work? Y'all hear me, all right. Um, Terry has a little bit of a thick accent, but I hope you got some of his story. Um, I shared that video in Glasgow when we started the tour on Monday um, because Terry has a really rare form of brain cancer um, that is due to radiation exposure and 
Uh, as you may or may not know, um, there's a lot of naturally occurring radioactive material in the shale layer of the Earth's crust, and that comes back up when you frack, mixed in with the frack fluid that goes, goes down. There's you know, carcinogens and neurotoxins and stuff that's mixed into the frack fluid to frack in the first place, but there, it comes back up radioactive. Um, so Terry and seven of his neighbors uh, came down just in this past year with a rare form of brain cancer in this rural area of Pennsylvania where there's really not a whole lot else going on. Um, and then we just found out on Tuesday morning that actually he had passed away on Monday, um, really shortly after his diagnosis. So um, we're now fundraising to try to move his wife off of the property because she still lives there and their house is worth nothing so they can't sell it to anybody. Um, and there's no help, our government's not helping us, and, and a lot of the anti-fracking movement in Pennsylvania has really, uh, we've had to spend a lot of our time and energy just dealing with the constant onslaught of crises that come from the shale fields. So, you know, we'll be on a conference call or something to organize an event, and it's like, hey, we need somebody to come now because these people you know, this elderly couple woke up, they were passed out on the floor of their home and they need to leave their home for a week because they're still flaring and can somebody stay in the home so it's not robbed or something doesn't happen to it while they're gone? You know, nothing explodes or, you know, it's hard. It's hard to address all of the needs. Um, we're still doing, the two guys that were over here in the film um, were uh, Craig Stevens and Ray Kimball. They're from Dimmick. Uh, I'm sure if you Google fracking in Pennsylvania, you'll hear about Dimmick. Um, but an unlikely bunch, really. They are very conservative, you know, gun-toting, tea party conservatives who are not, you know, we're not anti anything except, you know, maybe, maybe a little anti-government, but uh, not really anti anything until their water went bad. And, um, and then they became very involved in educating people around the country and supporting other people. So Ray um, actually does water deliveries every every month or every couple weeks to families that still are living without water. And so we've been relying on church donations. Churches have started collecting water. Um, some people who hear these stories donate money and we buy water with that and we do some fundraisers in the city. Um, but there's still a lot of families living without water. And you, you know, it's, it is, it's criminal. It's, it's criminal that this you know, in the 21st century, in a developed nation, that this would be holding fundraising drives for water. And so it, re it really it really harks back to what um, Helen and Rachel were saying, where, you, you know, they, they take, you give them an inch and they take a mile. Man, they take a thousand miles. You cannot, it's like letting a vampire into your house. And then you think a silver bullet or a garlic is going to, a clove of garlic is going to keep them in check. There's nothing that will keep these companies in check. They will get away with whatever they can get away with. And so it really is you, it's you and I who are, who are, who are going to stand between you know, them exploiting our resources for their individual personal profit at the expense of our health and our lives. So it really is, I, I feel like probably most of the people in this room, I don't need to tell you, it really is up to us and it really is worth putting whatever you can on the line to keep yourself safe. So I really, I just wanna say, I am so awed by everybody in this room and we are so inspired in the US by the work that you all have been doing in the UK because you know, we wish we had known what was coming and had Gotten, gotten it together quicker to, to do the things that you're doing here. And all I can say is just keep doing it because you're doing a great job. Thank you so much. I went over time, sorry. <laughs>
Um, okay. Uh, we're going to move on now to the next speaker, who's Tom Barlow. Uh, he's a member of Reclaim the Power, who some of you probably know. Um, and he's going to be talking more on the issue of economy and jobs. Okay. There you go, Tom. Hi. Um, hello, Manchester. Uh, <laughs> as, yeah, as, too long. yeah um, as you can imagine, it's, it's not an easy thing really to, to follow uh, and speak this passionately uh, about, uh, about fracking from an economic and a political standpoint. And to be honest, that wasn't really why I got involved in the campaign to begin with. And, and, um, and it's hard to speak, you know, mutually about this, but when I first got involved in the campaign and when the camp first came to Barton Moss, I had a few trade union mates of mine and said, yeah, 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 Tom, you know, enough of your eco-crankery. I mean, but, you know, what about jobs? What about working, working class issues, you know? Like, what, what about us? And uh, I said, well, I, th I thought clean drinking water was a working class issue. But, you know, may maybe we need to talk about, you know, what it is that the government is saying is going to be the positives that we get out of this, you know, and we've got to evaluate these claims, you know, are we going to get jobs, are we going to get energy security, are we going to get cheaper fuel bills, you know, these are things that, well, it's hard times, and you know, maybe, just maybe, we might consider risking the planet and risking our health, you know, to get these short-term gains, maybe, maybe it would be worth it. So I started having a look at, you know, what the government was saying, you know, what the government and the, the chiefs of these companies were saying. And, um, you know, quite frankly, there isn't a case for fracking, economically or politically. There isn't one. It makes no sense. It's a false solution to a false problem. Because if you look at fuel bills, Lord Brown, who's the head of Quadrilla, Lord Stern, the United Economist, and George Osborne have all said that fuel bills will not drop. In fact, we know for a fact that if we engage in a gas economy, What's going to happen is that we're going to have increased fuel bills because the six companies that run the energy in this country have increased fuel bills 20% year on year for five years. And we're all feeling that pinch despite the fact that fuel prices have gone down year on year for them. So they're gouging, they're taking money from us and if we keep putting power in their hands, we're going to be paying the price. So I looked at energy independence, you know, I mean, you know, Russia is pretty crazy at the moment, maybe we shouldn't be getting gas from them. And, well, despite the fact we don't get gas from them, we get it from Qatar and Norway, yeah, maybe it would be good to get energy independence. But as with fuel bills, if we embark on a program of retrofitting and of investing in environmental technology and environmental energy, we can save ourselves fuel bills, we can save ourselves money, but we can also remain energy independent. If we meet our 2020 targets, right, for climate change emissions, we will reduce our in, uh, our importation of foreign oil and gas by two-thirds, by 65%. We don't need a new source of energy. And even if we did, it's going to take five to maybe 15 years. And this is what they say. This is Lord Brown. This is what he says. It's going to take five to 15 years to scale it up to an industrial level. And even if we get to an industrial level, we'll get two to ten months worth of energy in total from the entire set of wells. This is the British Geological Society that say this. Again, these are all government paid for reports and government people. So then I looked at jobs, and jobs is the big one, right? You know, maybe we need jobs, you know? I mean, we do. So I looked at the AMEC report, government funded, put out this January. It says maybe five to 32,000 jobs. But again, these jobs come after a decade to 15 years of infrastructure building. They go to mostly people from outside the country because we don't have the skills. Uh, and most of those jobs that are within inside the country are haulage because that's going to be 10,000 trucks coming up and down carrying gallons, millions of gallons of water. And what these things do not consider is the jobs lost. The jobs lost when you take all the water from the Lancashire farms that produce Lancashire cheese. The jobs lost when you put up wells, 7,000 wells around Blackpool when it has 17,000 jobs in the tourist industry. What happens to the tourist industry? And what happens to small business owners who put their money on their line and their life on their land, line when, as legal and general and nationwide say, that house prices are going to drop by 25%, right? What happens to those businesses? What happens to those jobs? They don't come. And again, we could embark on a program of retrofitting and investing in renewables and provide a million climate jobs. 
We can have jobs, we can have cheaper fuel bills, we can have energy independence. We don't need shale to do this. It's a false problem uh, it, and it's a false solution and it only benefits one set of people, those who are already very rich and very powerful. So let's not do fracking. Thank you. Mr. and Mrs. Barlow, I know you're out there. We love your son. He's on the bus. We will let him go eventually. Okay. Tom's mum and dad are out there, yeah? Well done, mum and dad. Bloody marvellous. <laughs> uh, we're down to legend after legend after bloody legend. Tina Louise Rothery um, from uh, Residence Action on File Fracking. Is it with that? Anyway, um, our last speaker, and then it's over to you fantastic people. Tina. Hi, uh, residence action on file fracking, you'll notice action on file fracking. We didn't come into this expecting to hate it. We came into it with a lot of questions. We needed to get some answers two and a half years ago. And ever since then, we haven't stopped looking for those answers. If we named ourselves today, it would be residents absolutely bloody well against fracking. But, <laughs> a bit late for that. So, and the, one of the reasons we would be against it is not because of all the facts that we know, it would be because of all the things we don't know. And how dare we not know them when we are this far along, this far progressed in actually having it in our country. You know, where is the industry tonight to answer our questions? Why won't they go head to head? In two and a half years, I've done an awful lot of media. You get dragged into that. And every time I do it, there'll be a pro-industry guy on before me. And I always say to the interviewer, is there any chance I could go head to head rather than speaking through you? And they won't do it. Why won't they do it? What about my questions is going to upset them? And what I've noticed is that when the industry is asked a question by the media, they answer it. And then the media moves to question B, question C. No one stops to say, hey, that answer to question A is a bit dodgy. Should we examine that one? Take, for instance, when the shale gas industry says to you very clearly, we, fracking, will not pollute your water table. And you know what? They're not really lying. What they're telling you is that fracking, that tiny part of the life cycle of a shale gas well, is less likely to pollute your aquifer than the fact that 5% of those wells are going to fail on, on installation. The fact that they're all going to fail over time, and that when they do well abandonment, and they walk away. Does anyone in this room imagine the industry is going to invest in coming back to check everything's okay for us? In five years, in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30, 40 years, I'll be dead. What do I leave my granddaughter? What do I leave her? You know, we've been on this tour bus for three days, and I love these people, but we're essentially sleeping in coffins with 16 people. And then Vivian is struggling with us. And, uh, and it, this is not fun. This is not something we choose to do. Sometimes we're asked by the media, oh, you're an activist, as if it's something jolly. This is not something jolly. This is not something we choose. This is an obligation. It is an obligation, particularly for those of us who have birthed a couple of generations. Because what you have to leave behind is clean water, clean air. I can't walk away. I, every exit door, my granddaughter's face is there for me. The knowledge that she will then have to give up, what, another two and a half years of her life fighting this? To, but also, now that we have Liz, who's been the most impactful part of this tour for me, because you can give me as many industry reports as you like, but I will believe first-hand knowledge. No one paid Liz. Someone paid for the Durham University report that comes out of their section, which is sponsored by... Um, the energy companies. Somebody paid for the IOD report, the Institute of Directors report, which is cited by everyone. Who paid the IOD? Oh, Quadrilla. But the IOD assured us they were entirely impartial. How does that work? Um, I had a chat with a gentleman in the audience this evening who is in favor of shell gas, and we want that conversation. We've been begging for that conversation. Monday can't come soon enough for me because I want nothing more than to have the industry in front of us so that we can get our questions answered. Because this tour, unlike what we do with the beautiful protectors, when we slow the trucks and we have an effect because we affect the investment in this industry, because we cost them money. Unlike that, what this is doing is trying to reach out to the very, very many people in this country who do not understand what is coming and yet are being expected to have it done to them regardless. So this is about talking about fracking. We can do all the other stuff as well, 
but we need to get the country talking about it. We need our government to engage with us honestly and transparently. And I know that's a really big ask for a government, particularly any this one. But let's not forget it's not a party issue either. These licenses were issued over 10 years ago. This is this party carrying it forward. Whichever one is in, it don't get confused by the parties on this, because in the end, it's the government driving it forward. Why is the government driving it forward? I think the fact that Lord Brown appointed 22 people to positions within the deck. This is Lord Brown, who is the chair of Quadrilla, who are drilling in Lancashire, and his previous work has involved appointing people into positions within our government. There is a revolving door like you have. There are people who work in the industry, work in government, work in the industry, work in the government. And much like I'll go from the protectors to the friends of the earth to Greenpeace, we knit our connections and we call favors from each other. That's what they do. But it's a lot more sinister when they do it. Anyway, so when you leave here tonight, we'd like you to talk about fracking. We'd like you to take it any way you can. And when they say, oh, were you one of those activists? Say yes, proudly. Because all an activist is, is someone who acted on a concern. And that's all of what we are. Okay, so thank you. I think it was Helen actually mentioned a guy called uh, John, John Ashton, um, he's, I think he calls himself a climate change diplomat, he's brilliant, you should uh, listen to his speeches or read his speeches, he's a really uh, wise speaker um, and he's on the panel for Monday, whether the pro fracking uh, panel turn up or not, we're still going to do something on Monday, we'll see what it is. But John Ashton's on it, and he said, who else is on it? And I said, Tina Louise is one of them. And he went, I would never want to go up against that woman. She's bloody terrifying and amazing. <laughs> Great. Um, Two and a half years of anger. <laughs> <laughs> Roll on Monday. It's all been one side. This is just the anti-fracking side. Okay, I've said it a million times. We invited everybody you can think of who should be here, isn't it? So we're really interested in what the people in the audience who are pro-fracking, what they want to say now and what questions they want to ask. And also particularly the people who are undecided. But this is very one-sided, yes, it is. What we found though with doing we need to talk about fracking is that when people start talking about it and you leave them to go and independently look it up for themselves, which is what's been happening while we've been organising this, I've waited a day and I get a phone call and they're going, I've I've looked it up. What do you want me to do? This is bloody ridiculous. We've got, you know, a, a brewer making beer called What the Frack Man because he's, he's found out what fracking is. No, he's a total right wing guy, you know. He said, people, I think people like you are scum. And he's now rung us up going, let's make beer, let's go, let's bring it all over the country. <laughs> the lovely Lucy, who's standing right in the middle behind you there, is now instantly shy, is helping us run this. She's part of an organisation called Flux Events. They're, they're managing the tour, they're doing the whole thing pro bono because they went and looked it up. It's been happening every time. You know, we found it's really effective. Go and look it up for yourself, I'm not gonna tell you anything. So, what I really like to do is op operate a tight little ship here. So we're gonna kind of take two or three questions at a time in clusters, but not carcinogenic clusters. Yeah. Um, three questions at a time. Now look, this happens a lot because a lot of, a lot of people here are, are anti-fracking. Please make them questions, at least to start off with, not statements, please, okay? So, I've got one here, Lucy, at the front, and a gentleman in the middle, and a gentleman <laughs> beside him. So let's start with those two gentlemen on either side of you, and then this young man at the front. My question isn't really for the panel. My question is, are there any elected local politicians or national politicians here today? If so, could you give us a wave? Uh, if they aren't, were they invited? Uh, and if they are here, What's their thoughts about what we've heard? Because I haven't heard a lot from Manchester councillors, which reassures me. Thank you, that's great. We've been told a lot that um, this industry's got strong regulations, robust regulations are in place. Um, I've been staying at Bartimos, I've seen some of the trucks coming out of there, leaking water, pissing all over the road. I've tried informing the police while we've been there. Um, they just seem to ignore it and laugh, arrest me probably. <laughs> um, and now up at Hull there was, uh, there was some rainwater at the site up there. 
We've got a tank up there collect, collecting the surface water and these trucks have come in to remove it. Now at the back, this, this tank that's collecting all this water, uh, it's got holes in it where it's all rusted, it's leaking out, pissing out all over the place, running off into the back into this farmer's field. My question was actually for the uh, industry people who turned up, but well, they're obviously not here. I want to know when these robust uh, regulations are going to take place. That's a gentleman to stand up front of Lucy. Just, just, just go ahead. I do. Hi. Um, you've all made some really compelling uh, statements, and my question is, is, is there any kind of central body that's set up, whether it be nationally or internationally, that we can actually present the, the information that you've shared? Because I've tried to do a bit of research myself, but it seems like a lot of the anti-arguments um, are very scattered. Um, and I can't help but wonder whether a central point where these arguments can be made in a really clear... Um, and easily presented way would be really useful. Brilliant. That's a really good question. Thanks very much indeed. Okay, so um, uh, Tom, are you okay for answering the first question for the gentleman about uh, local politicians being invited? Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, we, we did invite local politicians um, and uh, we, we emailed basically every local politician in every, every town. What has been clear from very recent media debate is that uh, the the, the parties mostly are sitting on their hands, even the Conservatives now have introduced a, a consultation phase for 12, 12 weeks when they were going to push through a law that allowed them to trespass underneath your land without your permission. They're now at least consulting on it, whereas they were going to push it through because actually the significant opposition that there is to fracking is now making everyone question it. Even UKIP, who had been openly positive, uh, have s stepped away from it. The Green Party are clearly anti-fracking, um, and the Conservatives, yeah. And, and I wouldn't make a case for any particular set of uh, parties. I certainly don't. I don't support any. Um, I support independence, and I support anyone who's on the right side of any issue. And to me, that doesn't matter where they come from, as long as they're working for the benefit of, of everyone, uh, for the people and the planet. But at the moment, we haven't had an uptake here. We have had in Swansea and in Nottingham, um, and we definitely will do in London. Can I just add to that, actually? Um, so what we found here as well was that a lot of local councillors who vote for these licences to go through, and MPs who have the votes in Parliament, didn't know about fracking. So a local group, Frack Free Cholton, put together a briefing pack and sent it to every single councillor and MP in the Greater Manchester region. We've not heard back from a single one of them yet. Pardon? A few months ago. Robust regulation, you addressed that. I saw that truck that you talked about. I was on Barton Moss that day, and we saw it leaking. And I would ask the same question. You know, the government talks about robust regulation. And I'll cite something I mentioned last night, which is we had gold standard regulation in the financial sector, and we bailed out the banks. We had robust regulation in the Food Standards Agency, you ate horse. We have gold standard regulation in our hospitals and babies die through the use of the wrong drip. When a gold standard regulation in fracking goes wrong or is not correctly applied, the danger and the harm that come from that are far more reaching than a death, a bit of food poisoning, or a banker getting sullen because he didn't have as much money as before. This affects our air and water. I heard a man um, from one of the uh, media crews yesterday address Joe Corey, who's um, on the tour with Vivian and us, and has been kind enough to put this on. And he said um, to him, why should we listen to celebrities? And Joe's reply was perfect, which was, I have as much right to defend my air and water as everyone else. Everyone is a stakeholder in air and water. So with regard to the regulations, yes, when will they kick in? We saw that truck, but we also know that in order to put those gold standard regulations into um, force, you would have to have agencies that were equipped to deal with that. The environmental agency has had its workforce cut by 15%. In Lancashire, where we are, when we asked them to come, please examine, there were four wells drilled, two failed. We want them to tell us what's happened. 
They will not come down. They say they will not come from Aberdeen to do this. They don't have the manpower. They never once visited any of those wells, even after the earthquakes. So there's our gold standard regulation. It's a myth. It's a complete myth. They cannot apply it. Karen? Exactly. And, and you know, there's, a, there's an outlet pipe. Bob from our group has a picture of it in Lancashire that's right near the Anna's Road site that they had to close down. Now, when they closed down the Anna's Road site, they told us, oh, it's the pink-footed geese. They're coming back. We quite like them, so we're going to close this site. What they didn't say, which they later admitted, was, whoops, we got a piece of equipment stuck. We've overlized the well. We're just going to shove it full of cement and quickly close that up because there's all sorts of problems down there. No one is there checking this and in applying those gold standard regulations. And when will they kick in? You know, the industry started. They've stopped it. They're drilling holes. Even if they say to you, oh, we're not fracking yet. That's like painting the bullseye and saying, no, it's all right. I'm still not going to stick the knife in. I'm just, just painting the bullseye. Nothing's going to happen. But, you know, once they've drilled that hole, as Liz pointed out, you've hit naturally occurring radioactive material, and there's every chance that that can then come up. So those regulations should have kicked in long before now, and we don't see any evidence of them. Can I... just, just add a quick little thing. I mean, we barely have any regulations in Pennsylvania, but even the, the scant ones that we do have, they completely flow all the time. And it's standard industry practice to dump this fracking wastewater in the middle of the night, in the middle of the day, on the road, in the stream, on the farm field. Um, they were actually dumping it directly into municipal water supplies before we raised hell about it. And then they were like, oh, we're not doing that anymore. We can't do that anymore. Because we literally don't have any facilities capable of processing all of the stuff that's in frack wastewater. So we truck it to, so a lot of it's dumped in the middle of the night. We also truck it to Ohio to be injected into deep injection wells, which actually those injection wells themselves have caused earthquakes um, because you're changing the pressure. And, and so, yeah, that's, that's, it's not just the fracking itself, it's the injection wells that also cause earthquakes. Um, with, the, with the last question, um, I'll, I'll just say a little bit, but you're welcome to join us, won't they? I'm really racking my brains. It's a really important question. You know, the country should have a totally balanced centre point where you can go and get the resources to make up your own mind. It's really hard to find that. Um, the only thing I can think of uh, is, I'm sure almost everyone in the room knows about a site called Frack Off, the website Frack Off, but of course it's very heavily, well obviously we don't think they're heavily biased, we think they're doing an amazing job. But the one, I think, one thing I can think of is, um, and this isn't advertising, but our website, talkfracking.org, we managed to get a brilliant cartoon strip done by a guy called Daryl Cunningham. And I chose it because it's the most balanced account, scientific account. It's really straightforward, you know. I really recommend that's a good place to start. Yeah? But thanks, that's a good question. Do you, do you want to add to that? Yeah, so, well, there's no shortage of, of reports, actually, that do compile all the evidence about the environmental, the health, and the climate change impacts of, of this industry. The United Nations Environment Programme has done a, a really long report which came out last year. The European Commission has also done one. But you never hear the industry or the government talk about these at all. Of course, they will only talk about the ones that they pay for and that say what they want them to say. But one place that should be putting across both sides and, and the balanced view is the government's, they set up a special office, the Office of Unconventional Gas and Oil. And if you look at their materials, it is shocking. It's exactly what the industry says. It's got things in it like there's been 200 fracked wells um, in the UK. When we know that is not true, there's been one well that's been fracked and that's the one up near Blackpool that caused earth tremors and that has had problems with, with the well. So the government, the, the office that it's set up to do the job, supposedly, of communicating with communities is actually just selling the industry's propaganda. Um, I was, I was also going to say the Frackoff website, like they work really hard, they are getting more volunteers who are putting together information, if there's something that's not on there, email them, they probably will know it. At Barton Moss we saw trucks of radio, radioactive labels going into the site and within a day Frackoff had something up about how this radi radioactive material has been lost in America, it's been dropped down wells, it's disappeared, it's been transported along roads. 
So yeah, it's a brilliant site, run by volunteers, and a really good resource. Back off. Dot org. Dot uk. Yeah. Back off. Dot org. Dot uk. Yeah. That was a great question, though. Thank you. Excellent. All right. So the next three. This young lady here, Lucy. Um, try and keep it so you don't have to run up and down. Uh, and oh, brilliant. Thank you, Annette. Cool. So. Sorry, Jamie. It's not going to be a question. But a statement, if you oh, don't no, no, please, sir. let's just have questions first and then wait, wait to the end, is that all right? We'll... Well, it, I just, okay. I'm from the trade union movement and we yeah. represent six million people across the country, yeah, yeah. so yeah. I think, you know, I can do a, a very short one. Just, I'm, I'm Clara Paylard from the PCS, the National right. Executive, and we want to bring our wishes of solidarity to this meeting from the trade union movement, because many unions support the anti striking movement. And, and just, just a very quick one, I mean, there is no robust regulation in this country. And I'll give you one example. I was at a meeting last Thursday with the National TUC Congress, with all the trade unions and experts from DEC, from the Health and Safety Executive, and from the Environmental Agency. And what we discovered is that when they talk about an independent well examiner, it's people employed by the industry, for the industry, and at the price of the industry. So there's no independent uh, you know, research on this. But the fact is, the frackers are using unemployment and austerity and the bankers crisis to sell us fracking jobs. Because the thing is, even if it was safe, we wouldn't want it because fracking creates more CO2 emission than the coal industry and more methane uh, leakage uh, into the, the air. So what we need at the moment is a massive alliance of local communities, environmental campaigners, but also the trade union movement, which are representing 6 million people across this country. Because in 2012, we managed to push a motion to the TUC Congress against fracking, and now every single union is thinking, actually, this is a union issue, and we need to get workers on board on this. Because the, the thing is, we're being told by David Cameron that we could create 72,000 jobs with fracking. But the reality is, even Quadrilla's report is actually talking about 2,600 jobs up to 32,000 jobs. So, you know, where are we there? It's total rubbish. Because the thing is, we are all victims of, of austerity, benefit cuts, fuel poverty, food banks, and other injustice including pollution, high gas prices, and so forth. So jobs become attractive to us when you know, they try to sell it to us. My union, PCS, has produced the, uh, the One Million Climate Job Pamphlet with the campaign against climate change. And what we're saying is, never mind you know, the 50,000 jobs they're talking about. We're talking about creating one million climate jobs in renewable energy, in public transport, in sustainable housing, and this will reduce CO2 emission by 80% within the next 20 years. That's what we need to do. So what I want to say, sorry it's not a question, Jamie, but bringing on Quadrilla, bringing on David Cameron, what we want to tell to all of them is, frack off! Gentlemen here, sorry, in the check. Sure. Thanks. I mean, Thank you. Uh, about 20 minutes on Google and Google Scholar, and I found answers for nearly all the questions you guys have asked so far, plus a few uh, facts which don't entirely check out, but I can show you the sources later. The main question I want to ask is do you realize how different the hydraulic fracturing is in the UK is from Pennsylvania? and that we've actually been doing hydraulic fracturing in the UK for oil since the 80s. Good question, thanks. And one more question. Someone else? Oh, yeah, perfect. That's Thank you, Amir. Um, I um, met as somebody who worked for the council and he was gardening. He kept, keeps the park and I was talking to him about fracking, um, what he thought about it, and he his pension is now tied up because the council's invested pension money. Now, one thing I wanted to think about is how are we going to get these council workers together with the campaign against fracking when they, 
their future is on the line. I, I am anti-fracking. Um, I just, it's just a thing that I've been thinking about. If your pension is tied up and you don't have grandkids, how do you? Nice. So, um, should we take one more question? Because we've only had two so far. This young lady here, so, so you don't have to run around all the time, Lucy. Sorry. We'll move around. Okay. Um, I don't know if you guys will know the answer to this, but just is there a genuine gap from where we will run out of the oil that we have access to at the moment into where renewables will kick in? Sorry, sir, would you let the panel ask the question rather than the audience? So essentially, do we actually, everyone talks about a short term or a long term cover, but do we actually need that? I'm not suggest. I'm not putting this question out there to suggest that we don't. I'm just asking because I don't know. No, no, it's a great question. Okay, um, so we're, with the first one, the difference in, between drilling in, uh, in, in Pennsylvania and over the UK and also that we've been drilling like this for 80 years, is that right? 80, okay, cool, brilliant. Uh, who's going to start with that one? I, I can just say that um, I'm not a professional PhD geologist. I did take a couple um, geology classes in university, but the geology is different throughout the United States, and we're fracking in a couple dozen states in the U.S., and we've seen cases of water contamination. And it's not just water contamination. You don't need to just worry about what's going on underground. It's, it's air pollution. It's We haven't talked about the infrastructure projects that come along with fracking, but um, if, you're, if it's not slated to happen in your backyard, guess what? You'll have a pipeline coming through your backyard, you'll have a compressor station which is needed to move that gas through the pipeline, which sounds like a jet engine taking off in front of you and is noxious fumes as well. You'll have, um, they'll try to create more markets for gas, which is what's happening in the US. We're actually, we don't actually need all the gas we're producing, so they're trying to create new markets in which to sell it. And really right now, I mean, the biggest reveal in, in the biggest flaw, I would say, in the industry's argument about energy independence is in the United States, we were sold, oh, frack your land, it's a patriotic thing to do, we'll be able to bring our troops home and never send them to war for oil again. And now we want to build liquid natural gas exports facilities to sell it to the highest bidder. So these, these companies, and I'm sure you agree with me on this, um, have no legal obligation to provide this gas to the American public, or in your case, the British public, at any locked-in cost whatsoever. I mean, it's going to go to the highest bidder. There's, uh, oh yeah, and well, you, you can address the 400 times more. Yeah, the fault. You're right. Fault. Yeah, we have the 400 times more faults. Also, I don't know how many times the UK fits into some of the American so states. Just clarify that 400 faults, because oh. I don't think a lot of people, and for the gentleman yeah. said that we were very, very different geology, and you're entirely right. But a report just came out telling us that, in fact, the UK geology is 400 times more fault lines than the US geology. So yes, we're very different. We're a very dangerous place to crack. You're bad enough in the States, but here we're 400 times worse. Also, we live a lot closer to each other. We're a tiny little island. Highly populous. Highly populous. We don't have much green belt left. That's probably the difference between us and Pennsylvania. I'm guessing they have a lot more space than we have, yet we all live closer and this is going to affect us even more. You also said, sir, that you um, that you'd, you'd found the answers to all our questions on Google Scholar. So could you tell me how many, how many according to the iGas and Quadrilla estimates, how many wells will we need in the Northwest to get 10% of the shale gas out of the ground? Uh, you've already said the estimate was at uh, 10,000, 100,000? 20,000. 20,000 in the Northwest. Uh, recently, they've released one where they're trying a new technique where they drill, multi where they drill out multiple wells from the same hole. Well, has that because been successful the, yet? That's already happening in Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah. we yeah. do that all the time. Mm. Texas and a bunch of other Yeah, uh, on that note, we are very different from <laughs> Pennsylvania. It's a bit harsh to say, but uh, in the past 10 years, a lot of technology has changed since they started in Pennsylvania. 
Uh, also, in the UK, by law, anything they put into the water or into the ground has to be stated. I actually already have a list. <laughs> That's not fair to love. Hmm? It's not fair to love. <laughs> Just saying it's not fair to love. Now, let the, guys, keep your point, please, sir. About Thank the you. Fault. About the fault. This is, this is clear. My house is, listen, when you talk about fault, my house is damaged by a fault, right? Now, we, you're saying you found on Google. Try and Google now where the fault is that got fracked. On the first frack in Blackpool, that damaged my home. I spoke to the debt. I spoke to the government. I spoke to the quadrilla. Now, you Google if you can see if you can find it. Because I've asked them, and they can't find it. That's the fault. But the fault, the fault that got fracked. In, 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 in Blackpool, my house got damaged. Now, what could have put a on their first frack, right? They drilled down and they, they lubricated the fault line. Now, I've been asking for two and a half years for driller. I've been asking the government. I've been asking HSC, the debt. They don't know where that fault is. Now, if you don't know where the fault is, you Google it, see if you can find it. So that's the first well they drilled and they made a mess of it, and that's why they had a moratorium in the first place. <coughs> They don't know what they're doing, and those are not the guinea pigs. We don't need them. Can, can I ask the gentleman a question? You know you said, um, uh, we've been fracking for many years. We, we've been hearing that from the industry a lot. Can I ask you how many times in the United Kingdom have we done high volume hydraulic fracturing? Deep wells, slick water, horizontal hydraulic fracturing. How many times? Uh, uh, the ones like the gas wells, the one that caused the uh, earthquake, it wasn't the first one, it was actually closer to the 20th one, which they had experimental tracking in. Can I, can can I ask you where you're getting that figure? Because we know that's the one and only time, because the DEC, the Department of Energy and Climate Change, has confirmed that we have had one incident of high volume hydraulic fracturing in the United Kingdom. What you're talking about, and you may just be confused, I hope, um, is that in the past, uh, before Halliburton came up with the technology in order to make this uh, possible to drill high volume hydraulic fracturing, which is in recent years, it's been less than two decades we've had this technology. So when they tell you it's long term, it isn't. In the past, we drilled vertical wells, sometimes we drilled horizontal. Often it was only into sandstone. It certainly wasn't down into shale. And if it was into shale, it wasn't done with high volume. And we put in, if you frack one well once, You've got to use about four Olympic-sized swimming pools of water, if you can picture that. About two of them will still stay underground. They're infused with chemicals, sand. They picked up naturally occurring radioactive material. It's really high pressure to fracture that shale. And then the other two come up, and you have to dispose of those. When you drill the fracking you're talking about, could you explain to me, maybe just to make it clear, if you're talking about fracking, can you tell me what a frack job looked like 40 years ago? How many? How much volume of water? Oh, I can I can answer that actually. Oh, okay. This this technology. Oh, we should we should let the guys. Oh, sorry, did you want to answer? I just I, to give you a little history of um, the. Okay, sorry. It was originally used uh, hydraulic fracturing was originally used for shale oil, which is the same thing which entrapped shale, put into the oil and trapped in the shale. It was uh, like you said, it was less intensive. Uh, it, when, I say, when you say yeah. less intensive, can you quantify that less intensive? What? In what way less intensive? Less water, less pressure, less... Yeah. So it's a different process, but you're saying we've yeah. done it... So it's not high vol uh, high uh, volume. No. Pressure. So but all, that's also, the, also, I think that's what's been misunderstood here. The only time, actually, uh, if I understand correctly, is that it's the one time... Where I would just like to get a point of agreement, because there's yeah. no point in moving one, on. Yeah, that was the largest one ever the, done. The once? Yeah. Uh, the largest one. That was one, the largest one ever done. Or the only Thank one. Thank you. And, the, and also, there's been a whole report on all the things they've done wrong about it. Yes, so it but we are agreeing well now it's only been done yeah. once, aren't we? I'm just glad Thank we've agreed you. on that, but thanks for your point, Amir. Also, there's I a... Know, if it's okay, I want to hear more. Uh, we've got to answer this latest question and uh, this latest question. Thank you very much for your points. Thank you. Brilliant. Yes, 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 yes. Um, so, uh, the question about pensions, someone, someone really wanted to answer that one. Oh no, who, who was that? Who, who wants to answer the question about pensions? It's a brilliant, oh, brilliant point that you're making. How, how do you get out of that situation if you're completely against this but you're stuck into your pension? And I heard the word unions coming out there. Um, I'll, I can answer that a little bit because we actually have a big divestment movement going on in the United States um, to divest from fossil fuels, which 
I think it really is more symbolic than anything is to get the conversation started and to get people talking about what it means to divest from, from fossil fuels. But there a number of places actually have totally divested their endowments from fossil fuels in a number of universities in the United States. And also, it's, it's really important to look at the at the business model of the gas industry because actually um, the New York Times did a number of really good articles on investors in Texas, small churches, a lot of African American um, churches had invested in shale um, gas drilling with the hope that it was going to be this like huge boom and a number of companies have actually ended up losing a lot of money so it's actually not, if you look at all the data, it's actually not the best investment and definitely a pretty bad long-term investment. So if you really care about the long-term vitality of your pension, you should probably put it in something that's not a boom bust. Hmm. It helps it is though, you don't know what it's invested in. Why is it always down to money? It's, well, no, money is important, yeah, yeah. Can we move on to Helen giving an answer? Okay, okay. Helen? Just on, so the, can you let, 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 Take turns, love. Nate, Nate, please let them. Let, we, we're going to run out of time. Please let them answer. It's not either or. The two are connected. I mean, you can't, you know, they're not, everything is interconnected. Okay. Right, but I think Helen, on, Helen yeah, had an answer the, as well. On the okay, can we move on, so please? There's, Helen, there's uh, obviously different ways that, that pension yeah. funds can be invested. They don't have to be invested in the arms trade. They don't have to be invested in the fossil fuel industry. And just one example, of course they could be invested in renewable energy, but why don't our local authorities use their pension funds to actually invest in renewable energy in local authority property? Why not blanket our schools with solar panels, for one example? Point. That's something that we can actually do with our pension funds to do a positive yeah, difference. Plan. Okay. I was only going to say to Clara, sorry, I'm going to steal it. Clara, do you remember when we were in Bournemouth, was it? We talked about green bands with the unions. And uh, green bands is something really exciting and hopeful. Uh, it happened in Sydney in the 70s, I think it was, when they were building the Sydney Opera House. They wanted to build a car park, uh, but it was on sacred Aboriginal land. And many of the workers refused, uh, but obviously they would lose their jobs or lose their money. So the unions got behind the workers and they came up with a thing called a green ban where the worker could say, you know what, this goes against my moral compass. This will harm a nation. This will harm someone. And we will call a green ban. It happened once in the world. Let's not be that hopeful. It happened once in the world and it worked and Sydney Opera House is still the only place with no car park. However, we spoke to the TUC, we spoke to Clara at the PCS, and I recently raised it with Steve Headley at the RMT, that we need to look into banking those unions together and calling for a green ban so that your teams can say, we will not deliver to these sites, we will not support, we will not provide accountancy services, we will provide nothing to this industry because it goes against what we believe to be um, a moral uh, issue. So um, um, I think that's something that hopefully you can take back, which would be great. Thank you. A really good question. Um, so the last, the last one was just um, asked. Maybe I have a question. Okay. Well, no, we've got, we've got, oh, okay. we've got one more, and then we'll do the next round. Um, about peak oil, peak oil. Uh, Tom, I think you'd be good for that. One. Okay. Um, yeah, and it is hard to be dispassionate about again, you know, about something that's important as our planet, and it's hard. Well, it's it's impossible, and it shouldn't be disregarded. The health effects, and the environmental effects of this industry, or anything to do with it. But if we are talking about an energy gap, as was said, there may be. Peak oil is predicted to happen by Shell in about 2025, by BP in about 2030, so about 15, uh, about 10 to 15 years. Um, as I said before, though, the important thing to remember is this. If we stay on target to hit our climate change targets by investing in retrofitting, by investing in renewables, we'll already be down to, by two-thirds of what we depend on from foreign oil and gas by 2020, whereas in that time, fracking will not have even started in an industrial scale. And when it does, if it does, by the most positive margins by 2025 at peak oil, it will provide maybe two years worth of energy at the very best, but probably only two months. Fracking isn't a way to bridge this gap if there is one 
you know, really we have to look at, you know, providing jobs by retrofitting our houses, by looking at renewable energies, and, you know, by creating a positive future that we care about and that, you know, benefits us all. Thanks. Thanks. Lucy, a bit of a running. Uh, there's a young lady at the front here. <laughs> yeah. um, yes, now then, I, I'm on this tour and I'm learning, and I would like to take the opportunity to ask our American friend Liz to answer something. I spoke to somebody yesterday in Nottingham, and he was telling me that the idea that we've been sold for so long about American security and this wonderful industry of fracking that has made their economy boost. And I really want to know, not just, sorry, there's one thing, it's not so true, is it? Because they're not caring about um, the cleanup and the mess and the damage and the sickness and the death and the destruction of the planet that they're causing. This has not been factored into it. But what I want to ask Liz is, economically, is it really true that this is a big success? And the man who I spoke to um, yesterday, he said that um, the companies had all had tax breaks. They're really, really, their tax um, interest was, was so low. What, Joe? Yeah, yeah. And so they've been kind of subsidized. Had that interest been the proper interest, they would have not have been able to make any money. So it's not true that it's this flourishing idea at all from, from the one thing he said. I'd like to just find out if Liz can tell us more about that because I really am here to try to discover the facts. Thank you. Thank you. This is behind you, mate. Thank you. Um, so, a couple more questions, then we'll get a last cluster. Uh, so, do you mind going up the middle then to Mr. McFadden? I'll take three questions at a time and then I'll answer. <laughs> um, Alan McFadden, I'm the president of Mercy TUC. Um, I, I, the first one, I want to pose a question to the five of you and the organisers. Will you accept that when you go to the other towns, you'll have a representative of the six million people sitting on the platform with you. Because as Clara said, in 2012, we brought in this issue to the trade union movement, the same as we brought the peace issue in, etc. I think what's got to be remembered is that every form of energy that's been extracted, whether it's been coal, oil, gas, and fracking, has caused workers to die, okay? They've died. And when we had mass poverty of, the, of a real high level in Merseyside, thousands unemployed, they took men up there to Paper Alpha and hundreds were burned to death extracting oil and gas. And the important thing here is the issue of the trade union movement, because we've learned the lessons as we've seen with the coal miners who dug coal and died at 60 years of age from emphysema. At the present time, the trade unions are with the campaign against fracking. However, however, the employers are not sitting back, as has been said, they're funding uh, investment, they're funding uh, reports. You need to be closer to the trade union movement there should never be another platform where there isn't a trade union official on there. Why? Because we represent six million people and we want to say to all our members, no matter how bad it is, no matter how much unemployment there is, we don't want to extract from our society, from our climate, gas and oil from this industry. All we want, all we want is to inherit the earth and pass it on to our kids, thank you. And, uh, one more question. Okay, sorry, I'm awful at this, but um, I have questions about Barton Moss. I want to know what happened after. 
after the media went away and after, you know, the, the kind of supposed people being arrested, being... Put your mouth on the mic, mate. Put Sorry, mate. After all the people being arrested for, like, being drunk in possession of a car and from both sides, what's actually happening at Barton Moss? And I'd also kind of like to make a comment, and this isn't going to make me popular at all. <laughs> this meeting a little bit feels like preaching to the converted. I don't know that much about fracking, but all this arguing isn't making me feel any more yeah, anti-fracking. If we're going to learn, then we're going to learn. You can't have people in here who know everything about everything, okay? Because all they're doing is talking over the people who actually want to listen, who don't know. And I don't know. I'll be honest, I know diddly squat. But I ain't learning anything, and you ain't turning the public into your side by being just shouty and loud and, you know, saying that you know everything about everything. Because some people don't. But you are. There's, you've got, there's, you've got there's talk really, about, really, there's talk really about trade unions. You lose, you've lost me. You've lost me. Environmental protesters, I, I totally get what you're doing. I totally get what you're doing. And I do support you, but... Can I, can I respond to that? Some people, some, all I'm saying is, some people don't know all this. So you might want to think of those people during this, what is supposed to be a debate. No, that's, it's not a debate, that's the thing, mate. Exactly, and that's fine to be passionate, but, you know, not everybody knows everything. So I have a question. I don't. Have you, have you learned anything, though, in the last hour? Anything, any one fact? Can you give me one nugget of something you might yes. walk away with? I mean, with? the poisonous gas, I didn't know about. I'd seen the YouTube video of the kind of tap being set on fire, but... How true is that? You can answer that. How true is the yeah, tap turning on and setting on fire? Methane migration is really common, and the industry the industry will say that it's naturally occurring, and in some places it is naturally occurring, but what we've seen, if, when you've lived on your land for five generations, and you could never light your tap water on fire, and then suddenly they start drilling and you can light your tap water on fire, that's caused by drilling. Methane migration that is 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 now has a pathway to migrate into the into the water table because of drilling. So the, 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 the scary thing is, is you know, lighting your water on fire and not being able to cook on your stove because your house might explode, that's pretty bad. But what's worse is the stuff you can't see <laughs> that is gonna kill you and not kill you immediately, but slowly kill you and no one's gonna do anything about it and no one's gonna be there to help you. And maybe if you live in rural communities, no one's even going to care. Well, and that's, I, that's a real problem. <laughs> that's what we're seeing in Pennsylvania, and it's a real problem. I mean, the same with everything in England. Nobody gives a shit until somebody actually says something about it, and it gets popular. But look, look how many people are here. True. People obviously True. care, so it's, 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 it's growing now. Well, I, just, yeah. I just wanted to make that point yeah. that kind of not everybody knows everything. Not yeah, exactly. That's why we're encouraging you to talk about fracking, and thank you. But there's talking, and then there's kind of shouting people down. Yeah. Uh, and I, I don't see what purpose that serves, so I'll be honest, I really don't. Okay, so if you want to take um, the first question, Liz, uh, back. Uh, what you asked uh, was, has it turned out to be good for the economy in the States, uh, the fracking industry? Well, overall, you can look at the uh, American economy in the last quarter, which took a little dip. So fracking's on the rise, and yet our economy took a dip. So obviously, it's not the end-all, be-all solution. And I'm not an economist, but I do have a couple in my family. And um, this is a classic boom-bust industry. So for, for anyone that knows anything about the resource curse or has looked at examples in Africa, Appalachia, you know, West Virginia is another state not that far from Pennsylvania board, um, that has a lot of coal and has, has been mined and is still being mined and is now being fracked. And West Virginia is a small state, but very, very resource rich. And if West Virginia was, you know, if, if resources made you wealthy and raised everybody's standard of living and, and, and brought about the prosperity that we see in the commercials that the gas industry is running on American television, then West Virginia would be one of the richest states in the United States. And instead, it's ranked constantly, you know, 48th, 49th of 50 um, in education, healthcare, quali you know, overall quality of life, because 
people are sick, they're poor, and they're, you know, left for, really, left for dead by the government. So you, you should, I mean, it just, there's plenty of examples. There's actually centuries of examples about resource extraction. I'm sure you can see it here in the UK with the coal communities. My mom was actually a coal miner in Alabama, and I've got nothing inherently against fossil fuel extraction, except now that, you know, the climate change is a thing that we know is proven. Uh, we should all have a little something against fossil fuel extraction, but I've got nothing wrong with people making a living however they make a living, except that this is a really deadly, way, temporary way to make a living. And we, the communities, the communities in some are, have already gone bust in Pennsylvania. Um, and there was one study, there's not an, as much data as there should be, but there was one study in one community that's had a lot of fracking the real income has stayed about the same and unemployment has not changed. So, you know, I, th I think the evidence that we have speaks volumes. I think what Vivian referred to as well was about the tax breaks. And here in the UK, you hear constantly how, how it's awful that we've got to subsidize renewables. Now, the subsidies for renewables are nothing compared to the 60% tax break the shale gas industry gets. So for every pound they're gonna take, yeah, exactly. So for every pound they take, the first 60p they get to keep, and then it's only the rest is taxed. So all that money that should be going into our coppers for our country, we don't get because they get a 60% tax break. And when you say, why is there not more development in renewables, and how come we don't hear about great innovation? Well, how can you innovate and get off the ground when you're up against the big six energy companies getting 60% tax breaks who can monopolize everything, including your own government with the power of the industry lobbyists? So yeah, the tax breaks, and without those, this industry would not survive. It is not a viable economic proposition unless it gets a tax break. So I think the, there was some talk about it being a Ponzi scheme. I don't know if anyone saw that Simpsons thing, let's get a monorail. And I think they were in a hurry. They wanted us to get this to take off in Blackpool. Mother Earth kind of gave it a damn good shake and they got a moratorium. If we hadn't had that earthquake, we would be knee deep in shale gas by now. And then they would have got away with it. But you know what, you guys, well, we all woke up really quick. And now all of a sudden it's catching on and they can get away with less and it's the tax breaks and that's exactly the area that if anyone's looking to research that needs the most thorough research somebody break it down how does it survive without the 60 percent tax break yeah sorry i just want to add that if you google um major large industries and i'm sure you can corroborate this um shell and a bunch of bp and a bunch of the large companies have actually written off over a billion dollars in losses in shale development in the United States and a lot of the smaller, so a lot of the fracking that's going on in Pennsylvania is actually done by mid-size and, and small wildcatters. But if you look at Wyoming, Wyoming, a lot of these companies went bankrupt overnight and the state is still looking to where they're going to get the money to cap these abandoned wells that were just literally abandoned in the middle of the night because these companies went bankrupt. They won't stick around and they definitely won't take responsibility for what they've left behind. Sorry, because I don't know, but this is what I imagine, that the way that businesses work is they make profits as quick as possible and they're all in competition. And I imagine that's what happened in the United States, that people were allowed a free-for-all, small companies, whoever they were, allowed to take out concessions on this drilling. And the thing is, they were all in competition with each other, and sold it off as cheap as possible for fractional profit all the time. And, and um, because of this, it, it seemed to be a great big glut of energy, which they're using up really, really fast. And now it's peaked, and now it's level. They sold off some of their coal because you can't consume everything in energy. And I just think it's a fake idea. But this is just something I worked out for myself, and I don't know if it's true, but I imagine this is how it could have been, that somehow we've got this myth that they made all this money in America. They did, but it's kind of over, and they exploited it, and, and we all heard about this thing. You got me, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, yes, your answer to that question is yes, of course, and it's great to have you and Clara here. Thank you for being here, of course. Uh, young man, absolutely. I don't know if you were at the beginning, but this was meant to be a debate, wasn't it? Meant to be preaching converted, as you say. You're absolutely right, but I don't know if you were. Were you here at the beginning? Yeah, 
another. Well, you can see from the film yeah. we saw, most people don't. You're absolutely right. Yeah. I mean, that's um, why this is, we need to talk about fracking. It's encouraging people to talk about it and go out and find out for themselves, without a doubt. But yes, it comes across as preaching to the converted. That wasn't our intention. Uh, so that's a good to, point to make. Hold uh, on, Tom. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry. You want to look at I just wanted to, to say, move on. yeah, just very quickly, that I agree with you and that um, it's been very difficult for me to be dispassionate and so forth. You're welcome to come and speak to any of us afterwards and speak to myself and follow up on resources that we will put up, put up online. Um, and a lot of people who've been involved, obviously, are very passionate because there's a, a great deal that goes into this and there's a great deal of emotion and, and, and a great deal of change that's very negative. So, yeah. yeah, I'm going to do that now. Yeah, I'm just, yeah, yeah. That's the last question, and um, Rachel's going to answer it, OK? We're doing our best, mate. Give us a break, will you? Yeah? We're doing this for free, and uh, we're, going a bit, we're, we're going a bit nuts. It's really hardcore, right? But do give us a break, because, you know, we're, we're not in it for anything other than to, you know, get people talking about it, yeah? With all respect. So, after Barton Muscle, I'm, a lot of us are feeling quite frazzled and tired, but um, I guess have now gone. Surprise, surprise, they found what they thought. They found shale under Barton Moss. They said they're coming back in approximately September. They haven't applied for a licence yet, but... They seem to know that it's guaranteed. Um, there were over 300 arrests at Barton Moss. Up to now, there's been five successful convictions. Every week we're hearing of another four or five dropped. There's not that many left to go. So that was a lot of policing. They press released a lot how awful we were. Actually, mostly anybody now to now has been found not guilty because actually the police were acting unlawfully. That's something else that's come out of Barton Moss. Um, we the flare, uh, we, the police passed it straight onto the Civil Aviation Authority, which is weird because a while ago somebody else fired, I think it was a laser pen at a helicopter and the terrorism unit were called in. Ours has been passed onto the Civil Aviation Unit and we've heard absolutely nothing about it. It's gone really quiet and we just can't understand why. Maybe because they made it up in the first place. <laughs> they made it up. We've asked, for, we've asked for radar information from the airport, they said they don't have it. We've asked the police for all evidence, they said they've now given everything they had to the police. We've asked for the okay. police helicopter footage, nothing. Yeah. All right. Another thing that's come after about Amos is there's a lot of local groups. Um, you can have a look, if there's not one in your area and you do want an information meeting about fracking where somebody will just come and talk and give you the facts, please feel free to get in touch with us. We'll come, we'll bring somebody along who knows a lot, who'll be able to answer questions and we'll help you set up a local group in your area. Okay, thanks, thanks for that um, update. Alright, so folks, we're getting near the end. We've got a bit over time, but there's a lot of really good stuff coming out of this. So I'm going to take... Three more questions, but only questions. And then I know that there are three, two people who have statements to make as well. So it's going to be three questions. Now, I know this lady's had a hand up right from the beginning of the evening, Lucy, just over there. Okay? This lady, this lady over here on, on, on the end there, yeah? Oh, Eleanor, sorry, I didn't recognise you there. Okay, this, gen this gentleman in, in the middle. And, uh, some, yeah, that's right, you two, you, you two there, yeah. Okay. You go. I'm running, running okay. out of panellists. I don't know where, where they've gone. Where, where have they gone? We drank the water thinking we finished at 9.45. <laughs> yeah. You're asking a lot. Are they going to get some more? Okay, cool. I'll be quick. They were, no, no, but you're fine. Well, go for it. <laughs> Thank you, mate. Well, 90% of the raw material appears to be water for this industry. So I just Talk into the mic, mate, please. You catch that? 90% of the raw material. Water. Is that right? I couldn't go to eat it. That's oh, it. There we go. Yeah, okay. I'll say it again. 90% of the raw material seems to be water. Um, and I'm just wondering whether you've invited any representatives of the water industry, water companies, or anybody, if there's any reports on that from their point of view, what their view on it is. Um, the other aspect of water, I would say, is that um, we seem to go through periodic 
periodic uh, periods of uh, drought and post pipe bans and all the rest of it, do we really have uh, four million gallons spare to lock up in every well that we drill? Thank you, it's a very important question. Um, and uh, who, who are you going to next? Uh, oh yeah, sorry. There's uh, two people up the front who've had their hands up right, right from the beginning, actually. Yeah, it's too late. This, this young lady here. Sorry, folks, we haven't got enough time to do loads. But we will be, you know, around at the bar afterwards, so yes, please. Um, yep, yeah, Sarah Broad, also from PCS Trade Union, and I don't think that trade unions are obsolete in the um, fracking argument. Um, I know that's not a question, but there is a question coming. Um, I've been on a lot of protests recently against austerity and everything, and I've had a little bit of trouble from the police, but I was just wondering why the panel think that the police are particularly kind of aggressive and mean to anti-fracking protesters. Um, is there something that we don't know that the police know? Um, and is it all a conspiracy or am I just a conspiracy theorist? Um, but yeah, that's it really, thanks. That's a cracking question. Okay. Um, we're, we're all fighting over on Yes, there you one. go, brilliant. Oh, hi, my name's Kerry. I've come over from East Lancashire. We've recently set up a group called Keep East Lancashire Freck Free. Um, talking about extractive industries, there's one extractive industry that can easily be overlooked and that's the silica sand mining that goes on um, with this industry. So I'd like the panel to share what they know about the uh, economic impact of silica sand mining and the health impacts of silica sand Thanks. and how it's used. Uh, okay, so uh, just to take up the first question. Um, the water, all in, the, inviting the water, in, water industry, <laughs> blimey, but you're obviously terrified because we're running away one by one. Um, uh, about inviting the water industry, no we didn't. We invited, we invited all the sort of major industry figures, um, but that would be a great idea if we do this again. This is, you know, we're, hanging, we're stuck together by cell tape. We look, might look like we're professional, but we're not. Um, but that's a great idea. And there's a lot of controversy about the involvement in the water industry, and what they are saying and what they're not saying. So that's a really good point. Um, but I think you've got something that you can answer. Yeah. Yeah, so the, well, I think your last question was topical, wasn't it? So, yeah, we can't really pull all, all that water. Um, <coughs> and it, there, there has been a report. The, the water companies have a, a body that, that they're all part of. And about 18 months ago, they put out the report saying, yes, there was some concerns about water supply. And then mysteriously, about a year later, they sort of said, oh, well, it's only really going to affect people in the southeast. No one else needs to worry about it. And then you look at United Utilities and, and who are the Northwest um, Water Company. And they, they're one of the biggest landowners in the region, so they can rent their land out to Quadril or to whoever gets the next license. And they also will sell their commercial, the commercial gain, they will sell their water to, to companies. So you know, they're not exactly um, un, unbiased um, organization. But yeah, the, the, way, the water supply is a big issue, but also the wastewater that's created vast amounts of, of toxic wastewater that, as far from what we've seen, and I was looking at the plan and application that Quadrilla just put in um, a couple of weeks ago to frack four wells um, in the files, they have still not got a solution for what they will do with this toxic wastewater, how they will treat it. They say they may recycle it and try to put it back down, use it again in the next fracking treatment, but they're not providing us with any detail about how they're going to do that. So water is a massive, massive issue, both the use of it and how we're going to treat the toxic wastewater. Thanks. Um, the police. 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 Oh, police. 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 Having done some protesting in London, as well as Balcombe and Barton Moss, I can honestly say I have never been more aggressively attacked than I was at Barton Moss. More aggressively policed than we were at Balcombe as well. Um, Barton Moss was the worst. They treated the camp there worse than I've ever seen any protester um, treated. Um, the reason? I, I would say yes. The government is so intent on getting this industry through that everything we do, even down to today, We've done this tour of Glasgow, Nottingham, and we've got Swansea and London coming up. No police have spoken to us. We don't, this is a conference center. 
Do they ask everybody coming into this building, are they terrorists and things like that? No. And yet today we got a call from the GMP. Greater Manchester Police wanted to know who was on the panel, what we were doing. We're in the Radisson, for God's sake. It's a, you know, this is a conference. They don't call everybody else in here. So yes, we are. I don't believe it's a conspiracy. I believe it's government policy to ensure that this country takes on fracking. And I think that anyone standing in the way will be heavily policed. I wish that wasn't so, and I wish it was possible to say our government is fair, but I don't think, let's be realistic, let's, let's not, you know, no one in this room is naive enough to believe that the government isn't pushing this agenda and isn't therefore trying to stop everybody who is trying to stop them. Um, unlike Tina Louise, I have been on a protest once that was policed as bad as Barton Moss. It was at the G20 and somebody died. The police pushed somebody over and they died. Um, are they picking on the fracking movement? I don't know. But what we saw was day in, day out, police brutality. They knew they had cameras in their faces. They were watching it. They were press releasing yeah. that, that, that we'd been the violent ones and then saying that they hadn't seen any videos of this. They knew that they did not fear punishment. They sent in the most violent, aggressive thugs that they had. And those thugs knew that they weren't going to be punished at the end of the day. That did not just come from the police chief of Manchester. That had to have come from the government. And if they think that we're going to lie down and we're going to accept that, well, they've got another thing coming because we are now going to be prosecuting the police of Great Manchester. Okay. okay. We have, um, we just found out that we're, we are going to get ourselves in a lot of trouble for going over time. So I am aware that two people really wanted to make a short statement. So please do that as short as possible, Anna, if you don't mind, and Barbara, as, like a minute. Otherwise, we're going to blow our contract. I'm so sorry, folks. But there is a bar and you can ask questions. Can we wait, wait until the bar and ask questions, folks? Yes. It's the, the last question that we didn't ask. Yeah. 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 There is evidence from the US on this. Oh, oh, in a minute, sorry. Okay, silicosis. Yeah, it's something that we didn't think would be like a 21st century worker-related uh, health issue, but the AFL-CIO, which is an American union, actually put out um, health recommendations uh, about how workers can protect themselves. But we, uh, sil silica sand is this really, really fine sand that gets deep in your lungs and actually like scars up your lungs, and then you develop silicosis. And we seen that the frac sand mines and this is what I'm talking about with infrastructure it's not just the drilling people they're 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 they are literally mining the banks of the Mississippi River you will now visit the US and see the bluffs of the river gone they're mining it and they're shipping it on trains to Pennsylvania and one of the uh, stations where they were transporting the silica was literally right next to a daycare where these this fine silica sand was blowing and the kids were inhaling it Anyway, it's a bad team, it's a bad team. Um, okay, one minute, Elena. Hi, um, a question at the beginning of the Q&A said, are there any political parties who turned up tonight? And I think the answer was no, they'd been invited, they'd not come. However, there is one lady in this room who stood as a candidate in the local election that just happened, right by Barton Moss, she's a Barton Moss resident in Earlham, and she stood for a new political party who sprung up in the light of everything we've heard tonight. That's called the Reality Party, and it's happened. <laughs> it's, it's, I've got to be so quick, I've got to be so quick. It's, it's sprung up because we didn't feel locally that there were political parties who were going to look at this issue. And I'm here with a little bit of doom and gloom, but with fire in my belly to tell you the truth about this matter. This commitment to fracking comes right from the top. David Cameron, from the word go, and I've got a quote here, says, Fracking has become a national debate in Britain, and it's one I'm determined to win. Right from him last year. Since then, they've granted 176 licenses. As Vivian pointed out, there is huge tax breaks. There's more to come. The weight of this establishment, this ruling class in this country, who have shares in these companies, who own the land as well, they are behind this movement. This new political party that sprung up to say no, we had an amazing meeting the other night and literally it explodes your brain because actually what is the answer to this is, becomes a greater question than fracking. They have apparently consulted 
they have apparently heard the appeals. They have rejected all the scientific appeals. They're going to do it anyway. There is, like you say, an estimated start date for September in Barton Moss. What that leaves is brave souls willing to risk their liberty by getting arrested to do a physical protest. In the Queen's speech last week, they have increased the maximum fine for aggravated trespass or resisting arrest, which is what they were all fined at at Barton Moss. It, the, the maximum fine has been increased from £1,000 to £4,000. There was a plea yesterday on Facebook from earth protectors from our local area saying there's £3,000 worth of fines that they've now got to pay. Thank you very much. Can, and can people chip in? Uh, what this debate that to, Tony, uh, Tony, David Cameron called it a debate. It's not a debate, it's a done deal. And the people paying the price are the ones on the ground. And if you accept that it becomes a greater question than fracking, then what we are forced to do is to question the legitimacy of the system itself, where the highest authority in land, the House of Lords, are also the landowners, and our elected representatives have vested financial interests in this. The land, the water table, and the air is not safe in the hands of the people who claim legitimately to run this country because of the system that they run that's impenetrable. Vote Reality Party. Thanks. Lucy, we've got to stop, yeah? We've got to stop, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks for that last point. So look, folks, it was really difficult for us to suddenly switch at the last moment to change it from a debate to a panel. We didn't want to be politically converted. We really appreciate the questions that you're asking. Well, we uh, no, I'm, saying, I'm saying I appreciate the questions that you're asking, thanks, and you're really welcome here. The undecideds, the only ask we've got of you guys is that the undecideds, if you would be kind enough, okay, to go to uh, Ricky, part of our film team, please, if you're undecided and you came here tonight, please go to him and just speak to camera and say what you think, okay, I really, really appreciate it. If you had to say what you were saying, saying, look, it was totally one-sided and useless and it's just people who are, know too much, etc., you know, give your comments, we'd really appreciate it, okay? Um, we were going to uh, hear, hear from you, but we haven't got time because we're going to have gone over the contract and it's sat. In fact, Lucy, that's going to be quite a problem. Is that right? We're all right at the moment, but we really need to stop. Sorry. Right. Okay, now that's cool. You've been brilliant. Okay, folks. Um, last, last thing I want to say then, basically, is um, please round of applause for our panel. I think they're brilliant. I'm really inspired by them. I know we're about to run over, but I don't care. Um, I want to just say uh, a couple of things. Um, what we have to remember in this instance, because, you know, emotions run high, you know, and why shouldn't they run high? Because we're talking about our kids' future here, you know. We're talking about having a duty of care for future generations. So why shouldn't you be emotional about that? Absolutely right. But let's just try and remember one thing here. What we, what we set out to, to try and do is to get people talking about it. You've got to educate yourselves and you've got to ed educate everybody you know. And you've got to, everyone's got to kind of make up their own mind. And one thing that keeps coming back to me that we mustn't forget is this government has no democratic mandate to put this thing through. Nobody, nobody voted for this, right? We've got an election coming up in 18 months' time. That's the time when the people of this country will decide what they want or not. Not now. In 18 months, Ten. right? Ten, Ten months. months, okay. But before then, before then, we need to decide whether you feel that you are prepared to risk the health of future generations because they are trying to pass the tr the change the trespass law so that they can do this under your house and there'll be nothing you can do about it. Under your farmland, under your house. We've got something, some work to do within the next 12 weeks of this consultation process, right? That's about all of your MPs need to know whether you feel safe about that and you're happy for, to gamble the future of your children's health on it or not. That's the question, that's it, sorry. Vivian, did you want to say something? Anyway, 
I'm afraid that this might take a bit long, but I'll have to stop when I get halfway through in that case. Um, one, um, just one or two things that I think were important that we should have said, that we sometimes said, but tonight we didn't say them. And um, one of the things is that this idea of energy security, this idea of energy security, is not our energy that's being proposed. This idea of shale gas, it doesn't belong to us. It's not something we should stand up for patriotically at all. It belongs to these few small companies that are friends of the government who've been given these concessions. They can do whatever they like with it. Now then Liz made the same point about what, what's going on anyway, but, um, uh, but anyway, so they can include it in their portfolio with all kinds of other sources of, of fossil fuel energy and they can sell it to China if they like, it's up to them. It doesn't belong to us, it's not somehow something that we need in this country. We can continue to get our gas from Norway, we don't need an extra source somewhere else. We've got as much as we need. We could go into that further, I don't have time, but it's not a patriotic thing, it's nothing to do with us, it's for these few companies. Um, now then, and what I want to get over as well is that the government is delayed. Its thinking is so antiquated. And I mean, the, the idea is that fossil fuels are fossilized thinking. If you imagine in 10 to 15 years, when they've done their experiments for fracking, what will be the state of the energy market then? I mean, you, the um, conventionally extractive fuels will be less valuable than they are now. The reason being that alternative energy is really increasing so fast that companies are now interested in it. They weren't before, but they've got to be because the technology is moving on. The price of solar is coming down phenomenally and it won't be able to compete with it at all. Um, um, unless it's heavily, heavily subsidized. And they'll have all that infrastructure there already, and, and somebody's going to decide, well, we already paid for that, shall we carry on paying for them to continue? Well, I mean, it is completely madness, unnecessary, whatever. So that is something that I believe we can win the argument, <laughs> we can win, win the argument based on finance. It's, it's not good for us financially in any way. We don't have to get really excited about things. We, we can just keep level-headed and, and win the argument on the financial argument. And don't forget this um, 10 to 15 years, the insecurity that will be in this country when people's house prices are 25% lower, when they can't insure them. Our whole economy is pinned on the idea of house prices. You know, I mean, it's just going to be, um, we're going to be in, you know, totally not knowing what to do. There's not going to be no plans or anything. We'll be, what's the word, insecure. It'll be just economical insecurity for ages. It's just not going to work on an economical basis. Okay, I want to say that. I want to say two last things. One is that we've talked about why aren't the councillors here? Why aren't, you know, politicians here? What we've got to understand is that, um, sorry, but I just mentioned it because I didn't want to get into all this, but the world is run by a few bankers who control the world by creating debt out of air, pressing buttons, then we all have to pay it back. They get They live by the interest. They don't care that it's all subsidized, just so long as they get the interest. That's how it, the world runs. And the councillors and the politicians are part of this club by being on the edges of it all, by supporting them, by getting the crumbs from under the table. They're all part of this club. They were educated at the same schools and they believe that they're some sort of special people who know what's best for the country and, and it's a club and they gain credibility by agreeing to everything that the authorities want. 
to keep the status quo, the terrible status quo that's causing the disruption, to keep it running. As long as they support that, they're getting the credibility from their club of friends. And, and my, a friend of mine who died used, had a great sentence. He said, their mind's made up. Don't confuse them with the facts. Um, anyway. <laughs> Uh, and, and actually, there's two small points left. The way out of this, he's, not, he's shaking his head, it's true. It's true. But anyway, um, the way out of this is we really have got to get different values. We'll be forced to get different values. Actually, business will help us. The solar that's coming, we'll have to have different way of looking at things. Nearly finished. Okay. Okay. And, and um, so... If you listen to, this is my maxim, and I think it's going to really, it's my only hope. What's good for the planet is good for the economy. What's bad for the planet is bad for the economy. This is going to work, and it also means what's good for people is good for the planet. What's good for the planet is good for people. If we have really human values, as well as looking after our planet, we will get a different economy. We will have a world where we help each other and, and everything will be wonderful. Anyway. <laughs> Sorry, and, and the last point. The very last point. Yesterday, we, I talked to a man and um, I, we were finished, and I just saw this man, I said, do you know where the toilets are? And he showed me. And on the way, he said to me, I came to this debate, and um, I was pro-fracking, but I honestly didn't know very much about it. And I've changed my mind, and the reason I've changed my mind is because I saw in that hall people who were so passionately concerned about it that... That's what changed my mind because the government's not listening to them. And I think that was really great. Thank you. Hi. Do you want one second, Gazer? Just. Okay. We are fighting in Liverpool and St. Anne's and Blackwell. We're fighting. This is an objection that is going to be raised for the back of Blackwell. There's guys there. Okay, listen, folks, thanks so much for coming indeed. Um, and some big thank you for what's just gone round uh, for Terry Greenwood. Thanks a million for that. That means a huge amount. Thanks for your time. More questions. Grab these fabulous people. And if you have something to say, Jamie. go to the camera just outside, please. Thank you. I just want to do a really quick thank you to Jamie and the um, Thought Fracking crew for coming here and doing what the government should have done. And an even bigger thank you to the Barton Moss Protectors who came here in our hour of need and helped us.